to talk about who Jana is and who Craig and I are. Um, we are a, a startup company in Boston, um, and uh, we sort of work in the advertising marketing industry, um, and uh, particularly work with clients to, who are trying to reach consumers in emerging markets. So despite the fact that we're a company that is all in Boston, um, we actually operate mostly in India, you know, Southeast Asia, South Asia, parts of like Africa and South America. And um, we work with cell phone, uh, we have relationships with cell phone carriers and, uh, and cell phone vendors in all of these markets actually all over the world um, that allow us, that, and it's this piece of technology that allows us to put money onto people's phones to top up their phones. Um, and uh, basically the mark, this allows the, the, these advertising marketing companies to, to give money to consumers in the, form, in the way that they might with a coupon or something in the U.S. Um, but uh, for which only really cell phone technology exists in a lot of these markets. Um, um, I do consider us mostly a technology company. We're about we're still pretty small, about 30 people, about 15, 16 engineers. Um, and I just wanted to at least quickly mention on this slide, we are trying to hire engineers. And uh, there is a lot of cool stuff that we're doing, including having topics for very separate talks, uh, <laughs> including uh, continuous delivery and um, moving on to, and uh, migrating to uh, Cassandra as our uh, data store, which is really exciting. Um, and then perhaps a little context also on, you know, why we felt like we're at least a little bit qualified to talk about uh, Django and Flask, and that is that Craig and I both uh, have some experience um, building real apps in the real world and deploying them and having actual end users using them, um, deploying and, and building real products um, in both Django and, and in Flask uh, in, our, in our lives. Uh, we worked together, uh, this was around 2009, 2010, uh, at a company called Conduit Labs, uh, where I was one of the co-founders. Um, and uh, we started using Django there initially to uh, we made these music games, and particularly this game called Music Pets, which no longer exists, but was really cute, um, uh, where this pet would, uh, you're sort of raising this little Tamagotchi type pet, and he would like go fetch music for you and like bring it back to like introduce you to new music. Um, <laughs> and uh, we originally started using Django actually um, for our kind of like CMS front end for all of that music data. Um, uh, to manage all the data around music and tracks and artists and albums and having kind of an interface in front of that that our, our kind of like music programming folks could, uh, could use. Um, but uh, it made sense for us pretty quickly once we had all those database models in place and so on um, for us to use it in the, in the runtime environment as well. Um, and we had a MySQL backend there. Uh, we, used, we used Django's uh, LRM stuff. Um, this was, again, as I mentioned here, uh, around the time that Django 1.0 was coming about, out, and, uh, um, uh, and I want to sort of admit and acknowledge here that Django has come a long way since then. Um, I did a little bit of research this week, putting this presentation together as to like, you know, some of the new stuff that's come together since I've used Django in a production environment. Um, and, uh, you know, and just as an example, the test framework stuff looks cool. Um, but I do think that the essence of what Django is and what it's trying to be is, is still really the same. And then, um, you, skipped, using, you skipped a sad slide about how Zynga bought Conduit okay. Labs and we had to stop using Python. So yeah. we, <laughs> yes. we spent our two and a half years in PHP purgatory. <laughs> now back to the happy part. <laughs> yes, so, so uh, Zynga acquired Conduit in, uh, in 2010. And so yeah, Craig and I spent, that, subsequent to that, Two years working in PHP, and uh, I'm very happy to be back working in it's another talk. Uh, Python yes. again. <laughs> a whole separate talk. Um, so we're now both at Jana. Um, we are um, <clears throat> we're using all Flask all the time at Jana for all of our uh, kind of web products. Um, we have a consumer-facing website. Um, we have an Android app that consumers are using that talks to the same web backend uh, using a JSON uh, REST API. Um, we have a, kind of a separate process that manages 
uh, all of this communication with the cell phone carriers and cell phone vendors that has an HTTP interface and it's sort of standalone on our, in our back end uh, server farm. And that's all written in Flask and is also a kind of a JSON uh, REST API. Um, we have our own sort of intranet administrative type websites that we built. Um, our, our primary data store on the back end is NoSQL. Um, and, but we do have, uh, this is what I was talking about, Cassandra. So we have been using CouchDB as our, our data store on the back end. We're in the process of migrating to Cassandra, but we have uh, different uses of Redis, uh, Hadoop, and MySQL in different kinds of places for different purposes uh, on the back end. It's another separate talk, but we can answer questions about that. More separate section. talks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of talks embedded inside this talk. The quick summary is don't use CouchDB. <laughs> Um, so, and I, um, I tailored this talk when I put it together, when I was putting these slides together um, with sort of the assumption that the folks at the Django meetup would be, would be Django people um, and, and thought it was worthwhile to try to explain and actually it's like most of what this talk is about is um, just in terms of the mentality, thinking about things, how to think about things uh, in a, sort of a Flask way as opposed to the way that you might think about them in a Django way because they're actually um, They're very different products and, and the way that I describe it here is that <clears throat> Django and Flask are trying to solve uh, very different problems um, And in particular This what I've written here is kind of like as I was thinking about it like what's the What's sort of the fundamental essence of like what is the, the, the sort of like bare bones thing that you need to do web development work in Python, right? And and really, it's about it's about mapping URLs to functions, right? I have uh, some URL that I want to tie to just a single piece of, of uh, Python code, right? There's a lot of little pieces embedded in that, like understanding, you know, having some kind of representation for what an HTTP request looks like, having a representation for an HTTP response. How do I get access to the headers? How I, how do I set headers? Um, there's some other stuff in that as well that are niceties like that, that both Django and Flask support, which is, you know, being able to run a quick little run server, like test server to test your app and things like that. Um, but that's really all you need to be able to build a, to be able to serve dynamic content from Python, right? Um, you might also need uh, template rendering in HTML. Um, so again, your content is dynamic. You're serving HTML web pages. It makes sense that you're going to want to have some kind of templating language to be able to insert, you know, different kinds of variable values or lists or whatever else dynamically as a part of your Python function. But uh, as I know here, like even that isn't necessarily part of what you absolutely need to build a uh, a web server in Python, right? Um, if you're just which as I mentioned, some of our processes are, if all you're doing is um, building a REST API that sends JSON responses, like you don't even need the second part, right? It's, it's really just this that's the important piece. Um, and that's the, this is really the only problem that Flask is trying to solve, right? Which is very different from the problem that Django is trying to solve. Um, and, or again, it's a, it's a proper subset of the problem that, that Django is trying to solve. Um, <clears throat> I tried to think of a, a bunch of different like kinds of analogies, because uh, there are a lot of them. Uh, I landed on this uh, uh, Swiss Army knife thing, where when I think about Django, I, I think about a Swiss Army knife, right? Uh, yeah, it does, the, it does the URL mapping stuff, where I can say, this is the URL that I want to go to my function to this function, and that's the URL that I want to go to that function. Um, and that's one of the knives in this Swiss Army knife, you know. Yeah, it does the, it has an implementation for the template rendering stuff, it's another knife. But it also has like all of these other pieces, right? It has embedded into it um, an ORM with this model architecture um, that understands relationships between objects. Um, it has the concept of a user built into it, has the concept of an administrative user built into it. It even has a website built into it, as, which is one of the popular features of Django, actually, um, where uh, if you've set up these models in the right way, they, 
you can just go to the admin site and you know, look at the different objects in your database, uh, test framework stuff I mentioned, and just all these kind of pieces that I think of as like, you know, Django is like this one tool that has all these like kind of different parts to it. Um, and then of course it has a plugin architecture that allows people to add more extensions, more plugins, um, to extend the functionality wherever you need to. Um, when I think about Flask, what Flask is, I think of it uh, more like a tool in a toolbox. Um, so there's all of these different pieces. One of these tools in the toolbox <coughs> is the URL mapping stuff with which I was just describing, which is the request objects, response objects, managing the headers, mapping URLs to actual like functions in Python, um, etc. The little web server thing, like the, the kind of like bare bones piece of like what that web development is. Um, it has the template rendering piece, but even the template rendering piece is a separate tool in this toolbox, right? It uses the, the Jinja 2 uh, template engine, which is a um, really a completely separate project. Um, and uh, it's a separate library that is a <clears throat> that <clears throat> is tied into Flask in a certain way because it is like very fundamental to, to a lot of the web development that you're doing, but it's it's a very it is a separate library. Um, and then it has a plugin architecture that allows you to plug more things into it. Um, but I, th I think the thing that I want to know more than anything, and, and um, you know, when you're thinking about the tools in this toolbox, um, the uh, the model architecture, that ORM stuff, is, is very decoupled from, in the case of Flask, from what the web framework is. It's, a, it's an entirely separate tool in this toolbox that you can choose to use or not choose to use. Um, and um, so it's, it's nice in a lot of ways, right? It's, you know, it allows you to swap out one tool and use a different one, upgrade a certain tool, right? Not upgrade a certain tool, choose a different, like, different database <clears throat> ORM, and that's, that's sort of decoupled from what your um, <coughs> what your uh, web development kind of like API is and like framework is. Does that kind of make sense? Is this sort of what <coughs> make any sense to folks? I feel like I'm a little fast. Mm -hmm. Let's try to take a breath. <laughs> Am I going too fast? Cool. Uh, I wanted to just point out like one example, and I, I think it is, you know, it's probably something that people who have any experience with Flask have, have already seen. If you have experience with Flask and Django, you've noticed this, um, that uh, the, the simplest Flask they have possible is, uh, what is that, uh, seven lines of code? Um, <laughs> Well, maybe not simplest possible, but the Hello World app in Flask has seven lines of code. Uh, it's, it's all in one Python file, uh, and it makes it a lot easier to kind of get started. And it really helps, I think, and I think the example sort of illuminates the fact that um, this, is a, this is a library that is really just trying to achieve one thing, right? Which is that it's, it's trying to serve the, uh, these HTTP requests and responses, um, and uh, take in requests and, and return responses, and, and that's really the only problem that Flask by itself is is trying to solve. Um, one of the things that uh, you know I always felt weird about was weird about Django, and um, I think opinions sort of vary on it. Uh, I, I certainly know a lot of people, and, and there's some, something to be said for it who like. Um, you know, think that the kind of app architecture of Django is one of the beauties of it, and, and I, um, I, I like the fact with Flask actually that I don't need to understand what the difference is between a between a project and an app to get my very small thing built that is only going to do one thing. Um, it's like when I start out the Django architecture, I'm already I'm being forced into a little bit of a mindset of a larger project than I like really need right now when I'm starting. And that's, I, I think, something for me that I, that I like about Flask. Uh, and similarly, I don't need a bunch of files to make this really simple app that, that I'm not yet using. And, uh, you know, I think there's, there's two things to be said for, uh, in my mind at least, uh, 
to be said for um, being able to start small and like kind of grow out your architecture as needed. One is a uh, learning curve. Uh, this is a really learning flask this way. And then <clears throat> using more and more of the functionality as you need it, I, I think is helpful rather than having to feel like a little bit like in my experience with Django, having to understand a lot of the pieces before you like really can kind of grok where they're trying to go with the architecture. Um, and of course, the flip side of that is it's probably easier to uh, screw up your architecture in Flask, right? And I think that's the that's the argument against it, right? And I think that's something that's appealing to people about Django, and it's, and it's a fair point, um, is that you are forced into an architecture that makes sense for medium-sized projects kind of from the beginning. So, um, I also just, this is a small thing, I, I do like that in Flask, uh, new endpoints just mean every one file. If I have a new, new URL, um, I write my function, I put in this uh, decorator, and uh, this is the URL I want it to be, uh, and then that's my new URL. And uh, Django has the concept of a you know, this separate URLs file, um, which architecturally, uh, or in terms of the way the Python is, I, I understand a little bit, particularly having done the research a little bit this week, why they did it that way. But uh, this is this is a nice feature to just be able to edit, just edit the one file to add a new endpoint. This is my uh, my kind of comparison slide with I made the same uh, Hello World app in Django, and uh, and these are all the files that that it created, um, and uh, you know it, it was four separate steps, right? At first, I created the project. Then I create an app within that project. And then I edit the views.py to add my function. And then I edit the urls.py in the other directory to map where my URL was going in terms of uh, you know, when that function was going to be called um, before the whole thing worked. Um, and I I'm conceding here again that uh, I think everyone would probably agree that Flask is better at uh, Hello World. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Champion. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, that's not what any of us are aspiring to be. But uh, again, I, I do think there's something to be said for uh, starting small and, and building out your architecture as you, as you need it. Does that kind of make sense? Cool. Um, I made this slightly larger example, which mostly I think will be funny more than anything. Uh, <laughs> um, get started. Uh, I, I wanted to give uh, a code example. I'm really good at HTML, by the way. It's, 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, but as a part of putting this, uh, um, this talk together, I wanted to try to be a little more illustrative using some actual code um, of what I mean in terms of the decoupling of your, your database model from kind of your like web development framework. Right? Um, so I made this simple thing in Flask uh, called NanoBlog, which just like shows you all the blog posts and then it has this really awesome uh, interface. <laughs> Uh, uh, this, you know, this is a test uh, body, uh, and then it stores that in a database, and then um, uh, just kind of shows the latest uh, set of posts. And uh, I put the code for this up, and. I made two different versions of the, I don't know if you guys can read this code, but I sort of, I wrote uh, two different versions of the model code, and I think um, this one is using SQL Alchemy, um, which is, if you're thinking about, say, switching from Django to Flask uh, on a new project, um, and you're really used to using Django's ORM and happy with SQL and happy with Django's ORM, um, 
SQL Alchemy, I think, is a, actually a really good choice, and you'll see it recommended in uh, Flask's documentation. Flask's documentation, by the way, is, is excellent. Um, you'll see it recommended in Flask's documentation as well. Um, SQL Alchemy is basically the library that is standalone, that is very separate from what Flask is, but can replace that Django ORM uh, library. Um, and so the idea here is that in the same way that you might in Django define uh, fields for title and body and so on, um, you can use some of the same model in SQL Alchemy. And if you were thinking of switching over, um, the, the model probably makes kind of sense in your head. I didn't do any relationship stuff here. but um, And then, you know, I think the thing to point out about this code more than anything is that there's no, um, and again, just to illustrate again the point that uh, that this is a, that these are like very two diff very different pieces of functionality of your um, of your projects, right? Is this kind of like web front end part and the kind of database back end part? And it's okay for them to be like very separate libraries, right? Uh, and there's no mention of Flask at all uh, in this library. Uh, in this models file. Um, and I made another one that uh, that used Redis. I sort of like, not super happy with this, but uh, it is, um, you know, if you want to use Redis, and it's totally NoSQL, and you're not interested in kind of the SQL queries and relationship between things anyway, but I just want, I just want to use the, the list functionality in Redis to make a list of things. Um, you're not thinking about, all right, well, what does Django think about that? Um, how does Django represent it? Um, it can be a library that's, that's uh, sort of in isolation. Makes sense. You guys are really excited about this app that I built. It's, uh, I put this up for free, by the way, <laughs> on our GitHub. <laughs> that's my gift <laughs> from me to you. <laughs> Such a game So yeah, the model class stands alone. Uh, it doesn't import any code from class. It can use whatever Python library is appropriate. Um, and in this case, I'm just I'm using SQL Alchemy. I'm using Redis. You know, when, again, it's like if I'm using some newfangled database or some newfangled like Python library and waiting for it to be, it got upgraded with a new feature that I want. I don't have to separately wait for the Django plugin to be upgraded to use the new version or whatever, right? Um, so, which is nice. Um, and uh, one way that I think about this too is um, uh, instead of asking the question, when you're working in Flask, first of all, you don't even think about it as working in Flask, right? When you're using Flask, you're, you're, instead of asking the question like, oh, how do I do this in Django? That's the thing that I need to search for on Stack Overflow or whatever, like you're just asking the question like how do I do this in Python? And I think that's a way. Um, and just a couple of examples. So I talked about the model architecture stuff and ORMs. And in our case actually um, we're not using any fancy ORMs. So part of that is um, that uh, we're using NoSQL. So the kind of like SQL relationships between objects are something that's not important to us to be represented in Python, right? Um, and so actually just the, inter and I mentioned when we started off here, like we're using Redis in different places, we're using, we are using MySQL in different places, we're using Hadoop, we're using uh, Cassandra and CouchDB, there are Python wrappers for all of those databases, and those are the things that we're just like building all of our, uh, all of our libraries kind of like on top of, what we're building our project on top of, okay? Um, and uh, same kind of deal with test frameworks. Yeah, question. Oh, a question. Awesome. Yeah. And what you guys are doing, I mean, are, are there users at all? Because it, it seems like a lot of data your modeling is actually built in the street front since you're like, yeah, you want to stick in Redis and get it out of Redis, then like using Redis would be awesome. Um, and that like MySQL be overkill, but it's like, are there? I mean, what we're using in production, uh, we present offers on behalf of <coughs> So the short answer is yes. We yeah, have, we have, users. We have users. members of our site. Yeah, so we have and we have, they, and they have just over ten million registered members. We have a full history of all their interactions with us. We have 
the offers that they're eligible for. We have demographic targeting information about them. We have a bunch of processes to match them and filter the offers that are available to them. So there's actually a lot of data that's kind of like from the side of this talk, but but in our application, there's um, our data storage is more than a terabyte for our for our primary database. Is it um, you know, these users have accounts? They log in. They they, they have accounts. They log in. We send them messages. They register phone numbers. They they accrue an e-wallet. So we actually they can earn uh, amounts of uh, money uh, in their local currency by doing various things on our application. And then, as Dano mentioned earlier, we have ways of moving that money onto their mobile phones because most of the world's their, the phones are prepaid. So they actually have a, a balance on their phone that is not so many minutes, but so many rupees if you're in India or um, or pesos if you're in Mexico or whatever. Um, so we can push the money onto their phone. So we have transaction histories so that they can see where all their money went and where it came from. There's there's a lot of data. A lot of data. So just right. So I mean, um, not not that like the, the user model in, in Django is everything you guys need out of the box, but a lot of it would be there. But you guys obviously very you know conscious made decision. Hey, we want to do some class. And so what 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 drove the let's build this from scratch class? Because it sounds like it was the right decision. Versus, like, hey, we get this out of the box. Yeah, in fact, we were just talking about this the other day as I was putting this together. Like, it reminded me that um, uh, when we built Music Pets, um, we so for our for our kind of CMS, which was mostly for internal use, where we're managing all these music playlists and so on. Um, we we used the Django uh, user model, and it, it worked out fine for us. And the concept of an admin and all of that. Um, but once we were, um, once our needs kind of like grew out of that, um, and uh, it's possible that things have, again, like kind of like come a long way in Django like since then in terms of like what people's needs are in terms of the user model. But, but like our needs got like kind of sophisticated enough and complicated enough that uh, it didn't make sense actually for us, for our actual like runtime members to use those classes anymore. Like we ended up making our own, uh, our own kind of like, you know, I think, player, yeah. <laughs> I think we called it a player, but yeah. Say again? I think we called it a player, but yeah. A player, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, you do make a good point, certainly, that, and one of the reasons people choose Django, and, and I, I don't at all mean for this talk to say that everybody should choose Classic and not Django. Um, one of the reasons people use it is that there's a lot of that stuff that comes out of the box, like the user stuff, and, and I mentioned the Avenue UI is popular. Um, and, but there's some... Uh, it's a question of whether or not does that meet your needs, right? Is it enough for what? Is it is it overkill for you, or is it going to be not enough for you? Is it does it kind of like hit yeah. that right? You know, kind of strike that right balance. We we actually had um, Dano gave a dry run of this talk to our engineering staff at lunch today. Uh, one of our interns asked, so if I was off, you know, back in school working on a project or something, should I should I use Flask or Django? And the answer I gave him was, for most projects, you probably want to use Django, right? Like the reason, if you if you don't have clear foresight that there's going to be something you need that is going to not, you know, where you're not going to want one of the pieces that Django kind of assumes that you're going to use, um, you get a whole lot of ground for free if you start with Django. Um, and most projects in the world look like that, but not all. Of them. Um, and for projects where you're kind of going outside those bounds, um, you know, at, as we were building music pets, we found ourselves slowly peeling out parts of Django. Now, I'm still glad we used it at the start because we got, you know, we were a startup with five or six engineers, some of whom were actually game designers who were writing code. Um, we were trying to get as far ahead as we could, as fast as we could, and we needed that that boost, right? But the price we paid was that later on, we wound up peeling some of those pieces back. Um, you know, towards the end, we wound up peeling out some of the ORM pieces for certain parts because the queries just didn't scale um, to the, you know, to the scale we got. We were lucky enough that Facebook, I, we did like one of the first four or five Facebook credits integrations. Um, I sent them a whole lot of bugs, um, and in exchange, they put us on uh, one of the favorite ads on the top of one of their pages, and we just got this onslaught of, of new members uh, playing the game, and stuff just broke left and right. So it was a fun week, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, we wound up having to add in different caching layers and pre-aggregate certain stuff so that we wouldn't compute it at runtime. All kinds of stuff that you know, we just wound up saying, "All right, well, this is on the side of the model, and it's not as clean as we'd like it to be, but." We'd like the game to work, so we're going to do what we have to do. Um, at a certain scale, that's, that kind of stuff happens, right? And that's okay. Um, if you're starting out the project knowing that you have certain requirements where you're just like, oh, I'm not sure how this is going to fit into Django, then 
it's kind of silly to start with Django, right? But if if you're thinking this is going to look a lot like some other stuff I've done in Django, and Django's close enough, by all means, like we're not here to bash Django. We like Django. Uh, one, one of the things I really like about Django that I don't even think about is debug equals true. So what sort of <laughs> what sort of support is there in, in class for that sort of thing? Yeah, there sure is. And that was one of the things I mentioned about. Um, uh, in fact, I'll even show you this code. Uh, I'm sure some of these ideas came from Django as well. Uh, run server.py. <laughs> no blog down out about <laughs> run debug equals true. Um, so yeah, a lot of those niceties are are built into Flask as well. Um, I, I don't have an easy way of raise an exception over here, but it, but it has a nice... Uh, <laughs> you don't have any bugs? <laughs> yeah, totally bug free. Um, it's, a, it's a very nice uh, But it does, have, it does have a, you know, a nice JavaScript, um, you know, show you the stack, uh, allow you to run little Python commands inside the certain different stack frames and that kind of stuff, um, which is really nice. Um, and it's sort of part of what I... Um, I guess I I, I, gloss, I probably glossed over a little bit when I was putting the talk together that said like it's really about mapping or else of functions. There's a whole piece of infrastructure there that's important, right? So the little like mini run server uh, stuff that Django and Flask both have, and, and yeah, the debug equals true stuff is uh, I think really important as well. It'll be the hot code reloading too, like all the usual development. Yeah, it does the code reloading automatically uh, in the little debug server. All of that, all of those nice ideas. Yeah, I have a URL that's, that just goes to. Debug, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can always get there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So with the understanding that you rolled most of your own architecture on top of Flask, um, uh, can you speak towards what you found about the Flask extension ecosystem? Yeah, I actually, I think I, the next slide. Yet? slide. <laughs> yeah, so this slide is you don't need a plugin. The next right. slide is, but if you do need a plugin. <laughs> okay, we're <laughs> sorry. Um, He's got a plant. You know, there are Flask plugins available. There certainly are places where it's where it's entirely appropriate um, to uh, uh, to not be a standalone library, but really do you know you do need to kind of like hook into the actual Flask app, uh, part of the Flask app. These are some of the ones that we use um, and uh, that we're very happy with, and uh, and this was uh, a subset of some of the stuff we have installed uh, for our app. Um, so there is, uh, uh, well, first of all, I wanted to mention Blueprints, which are not really an extension, but more of a, um, Flask does have the concept of what Django considers apps. Um, so if you, if you like that app architecture and every project you've ever done, the architecture has like made a ton of sense to you and, and that division has made sense to you, um, uh, Flask calls those things uh, Blueprints. Um, uh, and Anyway, so so login, session management type stuff, OAuth, uh, which we use for uh, <coughs> Facebook login stuff, Google login stuff, uh, the merging and compressing of JavaScript CSS. We use some of the Babel stuff for uh, for translation. Um, and yeah, there's a um, there are a lot of plugins available. And part of what I wanted to uh, I think uh, sort of communicate in this talk is um, what you might think of. What you might, if you're used to Django, you might think that you need a plugin for like X, Y, or Z, but really you can probably just use that library. But certainly there are cases where plugins make sense, and there's a lot of them out there. Yeah, if I can double up on yeah, yeah, sure. the question. One of the biggest challenges that I found in, in architecting Flask, say, versus using like a larger framework like Django or Rails, um, is is uh, figuring out you know how you are accessing uh, your uh, database resources or your persistent slave resources and moving that around. Yeah. Um, can you talk about? That? Yeah. I mean, so so what we have is we actually have a completely separate project that um, there's a requirement that you be able to run it without reference to any of the web systems mm -hmm. uh, that we use in the back end as as a library uh, in the back end of all of our web systems and also some command line tools and some celery tasks that are running asynchronously back in the back end. And that handles all of our persistence management. Um, so uh, we solve that by having a, a really structured architecture for that part of the system. Um, so we have, uh, when you said moving it around, can you talk a little more about what you're Okay, so are? like a couple of options are like, you know, one is like, you know, you have 
um, like let's say in Django, you know, you have the models and they're just there. You know, just you access them and from there it's an abstraction layer in your database. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you know, another thing is to use like you know a resource pool, you know, a database connection resource yeah. pool, where you've got a limited set of resources and you're going in through a class in order to get to that. Yeah. Um, another one is that you know your persistence layer is entirely different ser service, and you're making service calls so that you basically have a firewall between what would be your upward facing web application and inward facing your business layer and, yeah. and persistence layer. Yeah, so our, our current structure is um, we have our models. Our models work only in memory. There is a requirement that they not try to reach out of the process, so okay. a model can't go load something from the database. That's a sub-package inside that package I mentioned earlier. Um, we call that package Alexandria, by the way, because it's the repository of all our knowledge. Uh, we hope it doesn't burn to the ground. Uh, um, so there's a models directory in there that has all of our core concepts and, and the, the data that's stored in it. Because we're NoSQL, it's a little bit simpler than it is if you're doing that with a SQL setup because nested relationships are often stored in the same place and retrieved in one I.O. instead of multiple or having to deal with joins or the N plus one problem to go fetch and all that fun yeah. stuff you get with an RM system. Um, so see, one reason for NoSQL when you're trying to scale, and Dan will over this, we have the ability to send money to about three and a half billion SIM cards. Um, so we have aspirations for scale, we're not there yet, but we have aspirations for really high scale. Um, is it, you, you can co-locate that data that you know you're going to fetch at the same time all the time. Obviously at the cost of being able to cut across it otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have that layer, and then there's a layer of sort of um, data access managers or um, data locators. There's a lot of different names for it in different pattern systems, but there's another layer on top of that which is responsible for saving and storing that stuff. So you say, go fetch me things that look like this, and it'll give you back the inflated model objects. And in a test environment, that's usually just created them out of memory, and in a real environment, it's going to go fetch them out of whatever the backend stores are, and maybe actually munch them on the way out uh, if we've done version migrations or something in the, in the process. Um, and the interface to that library is a set of um, sort of workflow manager classes that have methods for use cases. So the, the, uh, the outside systems call that front layer, mm -hmm. which will then go fetch all the data and then do things with the models. So we try to push all the logic we can into the models so that we can test it and keep it clean and use it in different ways. Um, and then coordinate sort of the loading and saving on a sort of more workflow basis. Great. Cool, thanks. Yeah, the, the way that I think about it sometimes as well is uh, um, uh, persistence is a, is a really hard problem, right? Um, and it's a, it's a hard problem, uh, certainly if you want to scale, like no, no matter what you do. Um, uh, I think if anyone tries to tell you that, uh, that Django solves that problem for you by having this model architecture, I don't think that's true. There's a lot of once you uh, once you get to certain requirements or certain scale, like if you, you do have to do a lot of careful tuning and note carefully what kinds of SQL queries it's creating and so on. Um, so again, you, you're and that's the, that's true of whether you use Flask and it's true of whether you use Django. Um, you know, certainly if you use SQL Alchemy, you're going to have a lot of the same problems or difficulties that you, that you might you know kind of in your terms of your scalability and tuning and not having SQL queries that take forever. That, that you would have in Django's arm. Or... Yeah, and in particular, the reason we enforce that rule about the models not reaching out of the process is almost every time I've scaled something up and had massive performance problems that caused pain, it was because we were treating remote calls like they were local. Mm -hmm. And it was fine at low scale or with low cardinalities. And then as we scaled up, all those remote calls are, yeah, the latencies are just much worse, and there's not much you can do about that. Um, and that's what killed us. And so by design, you're thinking about that from the start. Um, that was kind of the thought process. Cool, thanks. What else have I got here? Oh, that's it. Summary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, again, I'm, I'm uh, you know, we're, we're happy with our use of Flask. It's worked out well for us. Um, uh, but uh, we also were perfectly happy working in Django as well. And they're both good pieces of software. And, and, and really, to me, it comes down to some of it is personal preference. But I think more it comes down to uh, whether it's appropriate for the project that you're building, whether it, the architecture kind of fits your project, whether it fits it kind of like at the size that you want it to be, and uh, that kind of thing. So, um, and uh, we're absolutely open to more questions. Follow, follow, follow us on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, do you remember seeing this amount of micro cable that's kind of like Flash, but for some reason it's What was it again, sir? Uh, pyramid. Pyramid. 
Yeah, I, I, I heard of it, but I've never used it, so I don't have any strongly informed opinions of it. Because uh, when I tried, uh, I didn't like the rough routing with the two things, but the SISA nano conference, but for yeah. some reason it doesn't take off the same way it crashed. I, I, think, I think with projects like this, there's a, there's a large degree of momentum, too. It's really hard to get two projects that are really close together in the conceptual space where both are really successful. Usually you get one winner out of that, just through force of community, uh, even if it's not the better one, actually. Um, I code on this thing. Not only does he code on it, he I traded in a 15 inch Retina Display MacBook Pro for that. <laughs> Whoa. Voluntarily. I, uh, I'm, I'm really very happy coding on this, actually. What is it? It's an 11 inch error? It's, it's the 11 inch error, yeah. Uh, totally happy coding on it. It's the great. the it's only thing I've seen him unhappy about is I got a 4K display. Uh, yeah, that I use. Once he got his 4K display, I was jealous. And that won't run the 4K display? <laughs> I mean, I use a monitor at work. I use a monitor at work. No, because uh, I was thinking about buying a phone for my sister. I yeah, no, I, I am. I told, this is the only computer I use for work. I love it. I love that I can just like toss it in my bag and it's so light and it's awesome. I don't. I would love to have a Retina Air. I'm waiting for them to come out. Maybe if you're a little bigger, you could carry a bigger laptop. <laughs> uh, over here. Yeah. In terms of uh, building kind of a REST interface, do you just use uh, Flask, or do you use a third-party plugin for that? Uh, we use, we use uh, Flask. Flask for that. Flask. Yeah. So Flask actually has some, um, and this is something that I, I started reading a little about this week. Um, it has some of the JSON primitives that uh, Flask has um, are uh, not not Django doesn't actually like quite have out of the box, uh, which is cool. Um, that's just like one function, which is like, I want to make a JSON response like yeah. out of this object. This is a di this is the dictionary, and it sets the mind type in the right way. And, yeah. and so it's it's nice. So it does your serialization and everything? Yeah, yeah. You hand it yeah, exactly. you hand it a dictionary of data. You give it a dictionary, it and it does the it right. Sets all the headers sets and the turns right. it into the text, and sets the mind type to the application JSON. Yeah. It's nice. It's just a built-in. Yeah, but how about the CRUD operations? Well, so again, it doesn't do any of the data storage stuff, right? So the model Flask doesn't care about it, right? It's right. A, so do you use a third party? Nope. The, uh, we use that same library I mentioned earlier. Um, all of our um, APIs are manipulating our business objects, our, our domain model. Um, and so we use the same Alexandria library there. Um, it's a different subset of it, usually, but we use the same library for that. Um, in fact, the, uh, for the most part, the Android app is calling a really thin layer that winds up calling exactly the same thing that the website uses. Um, but instead of formatting it with the Jinja templates, it just subsets the data to the subset the phone needs and then sends it as a JSON response. Yeah, we, I might be using the word REST in a more general sense than, than you're thinking of it, probably. Um, really we, do, we, we, we do have put get posts, right? Like, yeah. um, I don't think there's any deletes because. Mobile networks are weird, and the mobile <laughs> networks of the third world are weirder. Um, so trying to use all the HTTP verbs doesn't necessarily work, but it's yeah. it's a fairly restful model. But it, what it's doing is it's taking the updates and applying it through our, our own library. You have a question over there? Yeah. Have you guys been in a roadblock with that? Have you been building a roadblock? It's hard to see that because um, uh, Flask is so focused, particularly the parts of Flask that we use, is so focused on one problem, and it solves that problem. I can see us needing to wrap it with something to refine, build new abstractions around it, although I don't know for what. Um, I mean, we can stop using Flask tomorrow, right? Like, Because Flask is so lightweight, Flask doesn't impose the structure of your applications on you. It doesn't make assumptions about what your model is going to look like. You know, We have command line apps that are using the same code as our web apps, and there's no weirdness there because there's no... You know, that thing just knows nothing about the web, and it's fine, because the parts of our code base it's using know nothing about the web. You can certainly do that with Django if you're careful. Um, but, you know, the, the default way you're using Django, so everything gets django fat, right? Um, <laughs> it's creating all the classes for you, and you're putting all the stuff in it. You're using the Django RM for your, for your business models, so the assumptions of the way you're going to persist things is baked into the same way you're modeling your business domain and laying out your business logic. Um, we're kind of, we have separation on most of those layers, which, you know, means we could have done it really badly. Uh, in some cases, it was done really badly and we've had to fix it. But, um, you know, if some new, the only thing I can see is how growing it is if something replaces the web, right? Like, if we go to something where we're not using the web interface, right? So, you know, so if we're using like a binary protocol to our phones or something and not using HTTP and we get rid of most of the website, then we might stop using Flask, right? But we wouldn't have to rewrite most of our code because most of it doesn't depend on Flask. 
I don't expect that. We use some of that, but we don't use a lot of that. Um, so, you know, we're... <laughs> uh, we certainly have G, um, and because we're using the Babel extensions, yeah, they hang a locale in G, and that's how it figures out how to do the localization. Um, and so we have to be careful that we set that. Um, we do our own session, like user session information management. So we, we have a setup where, uh, as part of all our requests, um, there's a decorator around the business logic layer. Um, there's a thin layer in between with the decorator that makes sure that we take that data and put it in the right place so that the rendering does happens properly on the response. Um, so we don't have to think about it too much because it's kind of solved once, and you just make sure that new things have that one that one decorator in place. Um, but you're right; they, they can they can become pervasive. And when we have, when we have problems testing our code on the Flask side outside of the Flask instance, we're, we're just trying to run unit tests uh, using those or, or unit test or whatever your favorite unit test framework is. Those are the things that catch us, where you can't just run those functions because they expect some global state setup. Um, you know, the solution to that is to do very, as little as possible in those global functions and have a normal Python function that's just a Python function that does most of the work. Test the heck out of that, and then trust that class we can accept the global screen. Wow, a lot of questions. I want to go they picture. want the books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Picture right there, yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Um, so one of the things that... Oh, sorry. Sorry. I don't. I'm pretty uh, sure SQL Alchemy has migrations, but I know nothing about them other than that I've heard people mention them. Um, you know, I for our solution, it's actually because we're controlling our data store. It's in a NoSQL database. Um, migrations are like not a problem. Uh, we do change our structures periodically. There's a hook in the load process that'll migrate transparently on read. Um, <laughs> um, so when we change our structures, you add a little bit of code that changes the structure on read. Um, we store things in the form of JSON documents in the database right now. Um, so you get a Python data structure out, and you write a little bit of Python code to mutate your data structure if you need to. Um, so migrations are something we don't worry a lot about. Um, that's in strong contrast to when I've worked with Django or other ORMs where we worried about, and anything with a SQL store really, where we worried about migrations, particularly if we change column setups, and how long is it going to take to change the, the thing in the database, and do we need downtime for this, and all that fun. Uh, but the flip side is we're not using any tools like that where, where we are now. Yeah, there's Alembic and SQL Alchemy migration. Alembic. Yeah. Do they handle this data migration besides just changing the data structure? No, data migration you have to write your own. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So, have you done any uh, performance uh, comparison? Yeah, I mean, so that's a tricky question, right? Because it's pretty straightforward to say what you're doing for performance comparisons with Django, right? So Django, you're using the Django RM, pick Postgres or MySQL, whichever you prefer, or know how to tune better, and, you know, it's kind of a fair comparison. Um, whereas with Flask, what you're testing against is, is not just Flask, right? It's Flask and a set of choices that is, has a much wider degree of freedom. Um, so I wouldn't say we have done that. Um, I would be astounded if there was any performance dis difference in the part of the problem that is the same. That is, if you just wrote view functions that didn't use any models in Django um, and mapped URLs, and then you did something similar in Flask without touching a persistent store in either place, that time is going to be dominated by whatever you're writing in the logic and the bindings to whichever web server you're using. Um, there's just not that much there to make it yeah, very I different. I think that's right. I, I think that it's those performance issues are going to be about the, your choice of data store in general. Probably more than about your your choice of like your you know, the libraries that you use for your web thing. The, the performance problems we have are not related to Flask. When we have performance problems, it's either a bad algorithm that somebody didn't test against data as big as we have in production, or slowdowns in one of our data stores that have the usual solutions for dealing with slowdowns in the data store. Yeah, yeah. For like worker processes, do you use Celery 
with flask or what? Uh, we use celery, not in any way that's particularly tied in flask. Um, so we have several different um, celery workers that we run on different machines for different purposes. Um, the communication mechanism Vano mentioned earlier that actually deals with communicating with the operators all over the world to push money onto phones. And it also sends emails and SMSs and does a bunch of other communication stuff. It's basically all celery. There's a really thin flask layer to take requests and report on statuses. Um, and everything else is celery in the background there. And we use it for some other stuff. And you don't need a plug in. No, we just start a we just start a celery worker and you import the project and call the the task the way you would call the task. So you guys have like a decision maker to give to someone on the Django versus um, <laughs> you know, Flask? Is it like if you know you need these things or any of these things go Django versus, or do you think of like you know Flask unless you need this? And does it break down that? that or? Uh, well, I'll hear your opinion on this. I'll say five <laughs> uh, I don't have such a matrix. Oh yes, that's my next slide. No. <laughs> um, I um, yeah, I mean, I think that. I was gonna say that Django is actually probably a pretty good place for a, for a, uh, a complete newbie like web developer who wants to build kind of like a medium-sized project to start. Um, and exactly for that reason that I that I kind of mentioned earlier, where it, it does force you into thinking about something that's an architecture that works for a medium-sized project, right? Um, and has a reasonable set of technology choices and trade-offs that are gonna work for yeah, the and, vast and majority it, of projects. And again, abstracts away enough of the storage stuff where you maybe you don't have to know everything about SQL to be able to use it, right? But uh, at least, you know, if you, if you understand Python and understand how the, um, <clears throat> how Django works, like, it's probably a good kind of uh, uh, way to get used to, and I consider Rails sort of similar, right? It's a way to kind of like get used to an architecture that everybody kind of knows works for like kind of medium-sized uh, medium-sized websites. Um, that's one reason I would, I think I would, I'd certainly use Django. Um, uh, you know, having said that, uh, I think the opposite is, you know, folks like, part of the reason I think, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think part of the reason that we're happy with having used Flask is we're two people who have, you know, a lot of experience writing software and a lot of experience writing software that that uh, is consumer-facing and that millions of people use and um, and have really learned from our mistakes over the course of our career, certainly I have, um, where I know not to, you know, <clears throat> mix my views and, views and my models together or whatever else because I learned that from experience because I was trying you suffered to, in the past I to do it. <laughs> <laughs> however I felt like made sense when I started my career, right? Um, and so th there is kind of a balance there, right? It's, it's one thing to... Um, to uh, uh, sort of force someone into an architecture, and there's a separate thing which is that that's a good architecture, and, and, and a separate thing to, to teach somebody why they're doing it but in, in a particular way, and that there there are other ways that it could have been, and this is the reason it makes sense in this particular case. No, that's one of my thoughts about it. I have a, I agree with what Dano said, but I have a, a couple more thoughts to add. So, um, if you have an existing code base that you need to put a web interface on, you probably want Flask. Um, it's, it's lighter, it makes your assumptions about what it's working with, and you'll be able to kind of use that with less pain um, and kind of get to it. Uh, if you don't know any web frameworks and you're new to this, I agree with Dano, you're probably better off using Django because it will make a lot of the decisions for you in a way that is reasonable and sane and save you a lot of pain later. Um, if you're familiar with Django and you can't think of a reason why uh, Django would be a real pain for the project you're working on, I would probably use Django. Um, <laughs> On the other hand, if you're familiar with Django and you really wish you could do something that like isn't that, that means like oh, but that means I'm not going to use the ORM system, and so the admin stuff won't work, and so um, then maybe you just want Flask and build the rest of the stuff the way you want. Um, I uh, you know I find some of this is about how you think about growing your software architectures. Um, I like to start with a small piece and make sure it works and kind of grow it out um, and keep it as simple as I can um, and. And I trust myself at this point enough that I'm willing to suffer the pains if I mess it up as I grow it. Um, and then I'm going to refactor it as I go and keep it that way. And so I would tend to reach for Flask because honestly, I'd have to page Django back in my head at this point. 
and there's not so much flash that it's like even pageable, really. It's like, <laughs> you know. Stays in your cache. Yeah, it just stays in the cache, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's in the ROM now, right? It's, <laughs> um, but, you know, if, if you had come to us in 2010 when Zynga bought Conduit Labs and we were moving from Django to PHP and I was starting a new project, I would have reached for Django, right? And I would have been perfectly happy with that for up to a certain scale, knowing that there were some parts I'd, I'd have to rework if I got to the happy place where you're at a spot where, which, you know, which is a, it's not most projects, right? It's the aspiration of lots of projects, but you don't get there for, for a long time in most projects, and you can get a long way faster than that. So do you guys find your talk on Django on Flask? Because one of the things I could really see is like, all right, I got this large project and it's Django, and I'm starting to really, you know, Django's work, because it, it gave me everything you guys were talking about out of the box. But now it's like, wow, this user interface model doesn't work. And I mean, cream by the year around. You know, like, you right. say, now I know how to optimize my Yeah, I mean, right. it's SQL. Well, yeah, so we haven't, we haven't done that actual migration before. Uh, but this, this was sort of about, hey, we've used Django for a project. We're a different yeah. company now. We're both a different company now. And we use using class per project. Uh, sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, what I was going to say was, I, I think you don't wind up moving to Flash there. I think you just replace the parts of Django that you that don't work for you anymore, um, and it becomes an incremental migration because I don't think you want to stop the world and replace everything. Um, we're in the middle of replacing our database. It's not fun. <laughs> I wouldn't want to change everything else too at the same time. Um, <laughs> I didn't choose CatchDB. We inherited that when we were at. And I'm really thankful for the person who made that choice before we got there. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so I, I don't I don't know that you'd go all that way unless. Um, it, it seems silly, right? Like you, you probably wind up keeping the view. Kind of what I was thinking. You probably wind up yeah. keeping the view functions and the URL routing at least from Django. Like so maybe you Django utterly, utterly, utterly fell apart in terms of like yeah, and that's kind of that's working parts. when you were describing that's kind of what came to mind for me too. Is probably what would really happen is you you stop using different parts of Django slowly. Right? Like okay, the the admin model doesn't work for us. We need to replace that with a thing. The user model is not working. Okay, actually, the ORM overall is not working, and we have to replace our data store. And we need to use it, or maybe some SQL thing, or whatever. And then, you know, and you start like kind of slowly tearing out the pieces of Django that you're using until it boils down to just, you know, you know that, that's how we see that migration happen. And, and that, that was what we had started doing at Conduit Labs, right? We, we stopped using the, right, exactly. the user model for some stuff, and we had started using some stuff that was persistent data that wasn't in the ORM system because we had certain use cases where it wasn't working well enough for us. Um, and, you know, I think had we not been acquired and had continued to try to grow that game, we would have continued down that path, but I don't think we would have gotten to Django. I think, you know, the URLs don't pile would live forever. <laughs> yeah. um, one thing I do like about Flask so far is that to do URL routing, you actually find the decorator to the actual view. Yeah. Right. Which is fantastic because yeah, you yeah. don't have to jump file to file with the URL. You yeah, use. exactly. Um, does the URL routing itself allow you to use Prolegal expressions like you can do in Django URLs? Um, I don't know the full capability of the regular expression. You can you can pick parts of the URL out for parameters, and that uses regular expressions. Okay. Um, and I'm pretty sure you can do wildcarding. Yeah, so it's like slash ID yeah. slash you know whatever. Uh, yeah, it can have like parameters like, inside. Yeah, and we but do it's use more that, like right? straight substitution. And, 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 and it'll pull them out and hand them as parameters to the view function. Actually, has, has, awesome. that, has um, anybody? That's really cool. Does anybody here use Django's like regular expression matching stuff for URLs for anything more complicated than just substituting a string between the slashes? Yeah, yeah, a couple of you. Yeah, uh, it's always felt like overkill to me. Yeah, what, what were you doing? Like, yeah. <laughs> if you number know. of characters, like oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah. yeah, yeah, we do that too, like pulling out variable like that and stuff. I mean, he's saying like maximize it at four. It's like, this yeah. is exactly four digits. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like that. Parsing yeah. dates. Yeah. Parsing dates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you can use it to pick apart your URLs and pass those as parameters. As but, uh, to the and I actually, I don't know. I don't think there's a way in class to say I want to. I want to keep this as a regular expression, as a proper regular expression. The way that I would implement that in class, off the top of my head, would just be. Make it a straight string, and then do the parsing of the date. And don't bother. Don't care that it like doesn't map to the URL, right? If the date doesn't parse, you do that inside your function. It's probably how I would treat that. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can just return a, well, I've not tried something else. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's a way to do that. So you want, you want to have like a cascading list of places yeah. that match? Um, I have never attempted to, to do that, so I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, certainly you can return for a full responses, um, but I can kind of retry. I'm not sure if that's, that it might be, but I'm not sure if that functionality is there or not. You can redirect. Yeah, that's true. Actually, you can just also return the return a different endpoint, right? Yeah. Uh, you can just call the call the other endpoint directly and return that response, right? Rather than sending the redirect all the way back to the browser. But I don't know about a declarative like oh, this because it's it's not clear how you do the ordering in that case because the the uh, the binding is on the uh, is typically a decorator on the function itself. Um, and so, so if you had multiple matches, yeah, the order's a lot you probably have an indeterminate or at least hard to determine order um, versus you know, something where there's a centralized list and you could just say, you know, go down the list in order and find the first match. Yeah. Oh sure. I mean, you, you yes. If you if you really That's wanted to true. do that, you could have an endpoint yeah. that didn't use the rest of the dispatching. That's true. If you needed. <laughs> sure. Uh, you you could also um, you know you could also do that not using Flask but just as a WSGI uh, middleware layer, right? That sits above Flask in the stack, and we actually have several middleware layers that sit ahead of Flask in our dispatch stack. Um, so you could use one of those, right? And it could figure out what the list of matches was and try one and look for the response and then try the next one without going back to the client. Like, there's lots of ways you could hack that in if you really needed to. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't know what the use case is anyways, right? Like, um, so, so Django has a lot of form support. What, what's like in Flask or Django use form Yeah, it's the same thing. Sorry, same, <laughs> uh, same kind of idea. There is... Uh, Form support. Study T forms, I think it is. Yeah. So uh, Flash doesn't have one, but you use a library. Um, what you'll find, um, <laughs> what you'll find as you uh, start digging through the uh, Flask documentation, is that um, there'll be a whole page about this in Flask, uh, but really it's just telling you to use this library. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and in this case, W T forms. Uh, so there's some actually some good forms. Uh, support here in the same way that you know it's kind of like its own library uh, that is at, at just as uh, super obvious. So. I'm assuming we don't have model forms because you have models. I, if you did, it would be because you picked a model library that had model forms that had nothing to do with Flask. Uh, yeah, yeah. The the high level summary is that Flask is more like a bunch of pieces that are very loosely joined that you assemble into whatever you want, yeah. as opposed to here's all the pieces together. And yes, they're you know Django is modular. You can pull pieces out. of but the assumption is that they're all there, right? So you're sort of starting from like, here's a pile of pieces and pick the good ones versus here's what things ought to look like. And if you have a reason to deviate, well, you know, get out, get out your tools and start replacing pieces. We run into uh, problems with mismatch libraries. Mm -hmm. that. Um, you mean like uh, one of the libraries you're using has a dependency on a different version uh, from another one? Uh, it's theoretically <coughs> possible. Uh, we haven't hit that ourselves yet. <coughs> We had one. <clears throat> we had one point where we were. Requests, I guess. Well, so but that, that wasn't even our problem. Like, so so we do use the request library for for making you know HTTP calls to various web resources. Um, and there was one point where we had an older. We were using an older version of one library. Request had this point where they changed something from a. I forget if they went from a method to a property or the other way around. But anyways, you either needed the parens or you didn't, depending on which side of the line you're on, the version line you're on. Um, and we had one library that we were using that had a requirement for a newer version of it than the rest of our code was using. So that was kind of annoying. We had to upgrade everything, but it was resolvable. Um, it hasn't been a practical problem in practice. Um, we had, it wasn't even a Flask thing. We had, a, we had one other library compatibility problem where we were trying to use Gevent, and we had another library that the threading stuff wasn't working with. Um, but that had nothing to do with Flask. That would have been the same thing in any <laughs> how do you scale? You said you have how many millions of customers? Uh, we currently have uh, a little over 10 million consumers in the developing world that are registered with our website. Um, we have 
I don't know, a little over 100 offers at any given moment right now. Uh, obviously, we're hoping to grow that. Uh, it was less than 100 last month. We hope it's much more than 100 next month. Um, you know, we are still a growth stage startup, so we're, we're trying to make all this stuff go like this. Um, so uh, how do we scale which parts? As in, uh, how do you, you have like one data center? or? You... Uh, so we're currently, we're all in AWS. Uh, we're currently all in one data center, <laughs> spread across a few availability zones with the uh, replication of our data to uh, another data center, so we have disaster recovery, but we would have downtime in the event that that happened. We've decided we can live with that for now. Um, part of the reason we're migrating to Cassandra is so we can keep an active, active multi-data center setup. Um, uh, most of our business, as Daniel mentioned, is spread throughout the world. So currently, it's mostly in Indonesia and India, um, but our data centers are in Virginia. Uh, there's an obvious problem with that, right? So, um, <laughs> um, But we are also working on growing in Latin America, um, so it's likely in the long run, if we're successful, we won't have a single data center that works, but we should have a single data center that works for most individuals. Um, so, like segments of our data will be will be like have good locality, but our global data won't have good locality. Um, that's part of the reason that we chose Cassandra. But we're only switching databases because CouchDB didn't work um, for various reasons. I'm happy to get into over here. Um, <laughs> the uh, reason we chose Cassandra in the end was that it it looks like it has better support for the multi data center stuff that we expect we're going to need if we're successful in the next year or two. And I didn't want to do this twice in two years. Um, so that, that's it. So for now, we scale mostly by, it's, it's pretty straightforward scaling, right? We shard some of the data by data type, not by subsets of keys. Um, we add more front-end servers. Actually, so speaking of beer, I think we're getting dangerously close to beer o'clock. So <laughs> I'll give our speakers a round of applause. And, uh,